Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai ki te atia o Aotearoa, uh, wiki tua ono. Uh, tonight we have an awesome corded all lines up um, and the kaupapa is Aotearoa in the world. And before we kick off, I will open us up with our standard karekia whakataka te hau, which talks to uh, preparing and laying down foundations and readying oneself for whatever may come, which is, um, I think, pretty relevant given our, uh, our little shakes this morning um, here in Aotearoa. So, uh, me noi tato. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi ake ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei mauriora. Well, tēnei te mihi nui kia koutou katoa. And also, I would love to say a special happy vai aso o le ngangana Samoa for 2020. Um, it is Samoan Language Week. It's a beautiful taonga for us to um, to celebrate here in Aotearoa this week. And I just wanted to share briefly the kaupapa of this week. Is, um, please excuse my pronunciation. I get my deal when my deal hamuas uh, switched up a bit sometimes. But tāpina so also mō lau malanga, which means prepare yourself a gift for your travels and without further ado I think that's actually quite fitting giving the travel aspect of today's all. Uh, but I will pass it on to my co-host T Nash to kick us off. Well kia ora koutou and talo for lava. Thanks everyone for joining us and thanks everyone on the Zoom screen for, for being with us for Aotearoa Town Hall number six. So yeah as Tam said Aotearoa Town Hall came together uh, well, I guess six six weeks ago now, during the during the quarantine period uh, for the coronavirus, and we both felt like this was an opportunity, really, to have some discussions about how we uh, what we can learn from this period and how we can shape the the world and our societies coming coming out of it for the better. So we've had a a number of chats, and they're all on the on the Facebook page and also on Tam's uh, YouTube uh, channel and. And also uh, now, thanks to Wellington Access Radio, they'll be up on uh, up on that website too. Gradually, um, each week they're they're going to be broadcasting one. So today we're going to talk about Aotearoa and the world. Uh, where do we sit as a as a country, uh, as a as a set of peoples uh, in in the Pacific? Um, what impact can we have uh, on the world through our actions? Uh, what impact are we already having uh, on the world through? Our actions, and I'll just really briefly introduce uh, the different panelists, and then I'll jump right in with our first question. Um, so we, we're really pleased to have uh, Nikki Haga with us. Uh, Nikki, thanks for joining us. You're close to me, actually, in Mount Victoria, uh, here in Central Wellington. Uh, Nikki's an investigative journalist and and author. Uh, Tina Ngata joining us from the East Coast. Uh, tēnā koe, uh, Tina, uh, an advocate for environmental, indigenous, and human rights. Guled uh, Meyer, community advocate and writer. Kia ora, Guled, thanks for joining us. Uh, Nina Hall, uh, Associate Professor of International Relations, usually based in Bologna, but at the moment uh, in Berlin, uh, and one of my colleagues with New Zealand Alternative. Evelyn Masters, who's up in Tamaki Makoto, uh, Pacific Research Specialist and another one of my colleagues at New Zealand Alternative, and Sean Hendy. Uh, who is a professor of physics at uh, University of Auckland uh, and one of the people who was responsible for the modelling uh, that helped to, I think, keep many of us uh, safe or keep the country uh, safe from, from the pandemic. So we're so pleased to, to have you all with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, right. OK, first question. I'm going to turn to uh, to you, Nina, if I could. Um, you, you've kind of got an overview of international relations uh, from your perch in academia. I wonder if you could just give us a, a brief snapshot of how you see the world looking at us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, given our response to COVID-19 and, and whether you think that gives us a bit of a, a bit of an opportunity internationally and, and maybe perhaps also some, some more responsibility. Yeah, sure, kia ora all. It's wonderful to be here and be part of this discussion. Um, and as Thomas mentioned in the intro, I am I am normally based in Bologna, where I teach international relations, and currently in Berlin, which is a little overcast and grey today. But as um, things have been opening up here, I've been able to have a lot of conversations, both on Zoom and, and in person, with people and monitoring the news. And I can say for sure, 
people have been curious and fascinated at how New Zealand has done so well to essentially eliminate COVID and certainly stop community transmission. Um, there's been worldwide applause. Those of you have probably read a bunch of the news stories. The Financial Times wrote an op-ed saying, Arise, St. Jacinda Ardern. Um, the Atlantic, a big American uh, media outlet, wrote, New Zealand's Prime Minister may be the most effective leader on the planet. Uh, my Italian friends called me up asking after Easter how it was that New Zealand managed to make the Easter Bunny an essential service. Um, there's been a lot of commentary about how effective uh, Jacinda Ardern and, and New Zealand as a whole has been at, at dealing with COVID. And I've been asked actually to speak on this in, in a few, well, on one occasion in particular last week at, um, at Hertia Public um, Policy School here in Berlin over, over a webinar. And I think we should also take note that this is part of a broader trend that New Zealand is not the only country that has managed it well. There have of course been a number of other countries many of which have been led by women, which has been pointed out, whether it be Taiwan or, or Germany or Denmark. Um, and there have been some pretty abominable cases as well. Um, the UK, the US, Brazil, which happened to be being led by men. Um, you can draw your own conclusions. I wouldn't say, you know, essentially, if you're a woman, you're a better leader, but there have certainly been some interesting trends there. Um, and I mean, others on the panel, I'm sure Sean himself and others can speak to why it is that New Zealand has done so well and I'm happy to go into that. But I guess the, the question for today's conversation is more, well, what do we do next? And in a way, I think New Zealand's in this really interesting paradox now because we've done so well. What does that mean internationally? Like, who do we trust? Who do we open our borders to? Because most countries, of course, still have the virus circulating. Um, I know there's been commentary, do we open up to other you know, virus free or, or countries with very low cases like Taiwan? Do we start to create some kind of virus free bubble? I know the Australia New Zealand agreement is on the table and that will happen when, when the cases are low enough there. Um, but what does it also mean in terms of our responsibility internationally, like you point out Thomas, to other peoples um, or countries that aren't doing so well? And I think that's a question that will be really great to discuss today because as I see it, there's a need for international leadership. Most countries have turned and looked inwards and most countries are thinking about how to manage coming out of the lockdown or still managing COVID. So any leadership New Zealand can provide right now is, is really very much needed. And I'm, I'm keen to hear from the other panelists too on, on where they think it can be best uh, served. Kia Nina, thank you for that. And um, actually just um, speaking of Easter at the beginning of your corridor, I just wanted to also acknowledge that um, over the weekends, we had Eid Mubarak, so I just wanted to wish all our Muslim whānau a happy Eid for um, that weekend as well as um, a happy Samoan Language Week too. Lots going on in this time of the year. Matariki is also fast approaching, so it's no surprises that all of these um, cultures, we've all got the significant time of the year. Um, so I am going to move on now to my friend Nikki Haga. Tēnā koe, my friends. It's good to see you. Hope you're staying warm over in Mount Vic, uh, Mount Vic sorry, um, over where you are. Um, so my question for you, and um, do feel free to introduce yourself a little bit too if you wanted to from the uh, to the audience. But I just wanted to know in these times, um, in these kind of turbulent times, as we look at you know the the leader of the free world, um, how close should New Zealand or Aotearoa be to the US in a time like this? Um, I'm going to go from Nina's really positive discussion <laughs> to more negative sounding things. Actually, um, if if you can't talk about New Zealand's relationship with the United States, this, this is what I would say first. If you can't honestly talk about our relationship with the United States. Um, then you, we're completely, we're always completely missing what's going on in our country. Because <clears throat> although it's not always talked about, in fact, strangely enough, I'm going to say, although it's regularly not talked about and almost avoided even by the powerful and by the foreign affairs people and the government and so on, nearly everything that goes on in this country in an international way, the main factor going on is the United States. And what and how close should we be? Well, I think I think many people who are listening would probably agree that there are some ways where we want to be close and friendly. And of course, we actually desperately don't want to be unfriendly with the current US government. But the further we are away from them, probably the safer and more true to our chosen futures we will be. 
So can I explore this a little bit? If you listen <clears throat> to um, like ministers of foreign affairs giving a speech when they go to the United States, or if you read the regularly boring and almost soporific statements that come out about New Zealand's position in the world, they always talk about how New Zealand has its <clears throat> natural partners, its long-standing historic ties. And what it says about them is that, we, that what holds these people together is that they are, <clears throat> that they have, <clears throat> they are like-minded and they have common out there in these countries where we're like-minded and we have common outlooks and common interests. <clears throat> and when they, when they say that, that's actually coded language for the Five Eyes, basically, for the Anglo-Saxon, old colonial linked countries to New Zealand, and particularly these days to the United States. And the reason they use that coded language is to make something sound natural, although not too explicitly admitted, which is actually not natural at all. Because we are not even faintly in 2020, co having common interests or even like-minded most of the time with the United States of America. And this is the great kind of, uh, dramatic kind of historic fight of our times in foreign policy really, is what we do with the fact that we are simultaneously one of the closest allies to the United States due to old historic colonial reasons. And Britain brought some of its allies, some of its colonies like New Zealand into the Five Eyes arrangement. But at the same time, we're a totally different country now. The United States is a great monstrous and dangerous nuclear powered country that invades, um, bullies, um, undermines, destabilizes and organizes coups in countries around the world that its economic activities are impoverishing and degrading smaller, poorer countries to keep themselves rich. It's this with the, you know, the multinational driven foreign policy. And that's far, far from what New Zealand, that's far from being common interests and like-minded with New Zealand. So, so, I, so what I'm saying is, I think that behind this coded language is a huge whopping great choice that New Zealand has to make. And it's coming out all the time. It comes out, for example, um, and looking at the way that we, um, what, our foreign, what our defense policies are. Like there was this great thing um, last year where the Labour government put out its new defence policies, which were, and they said that the main priority of a whole of new of twenty billion dollars of new defence spending was going to be helping the South Pacific states with climate change. And I recommend anyone who's vaguely interested in this to go and find that report because it is total, absolute nonsense. They are talking about having new, all kinds of new equipment, which is essentially nearly a hundred percent for more closely integrating us into a Chinese, a Chinese targeted war by the United States. That's the only rational way you can, can um, evaluate the equipment they want. It's the same with the exercises that we go off and do with the Americans in the Pacific, which are their top priority exercises. They are all about looking across to what they call the, the inner and the outer rings, the first tier and the second tier rings of islands around China and a great confrontation between the United States and China. Now, China, our largest trading partner. None of this has anything to do with New Zealand. And I believe that the reason that it goes on is because we don't talk about it and because it's done in secret and because it's done with coded language like traditional, traditional partners and common interests. And if we don't face up to it, we, we are running a foreign policy and defense policy, which is just completely out of sync with who New Zealand is our and what we want to be in the world. Jordan Nicky, so good to start getting into, the, getting into the real crux of it there. I mean, I have to say, when when this government procured or made the decision to procure $2.2 billion worth of Poseidon P-8 aircraft from the United States, uh, which is the biggest defense procurement we've had since, what, the Anzac frigates, uh, there was almost nothing so i think you it's hard to disagree with the fact that we are lacking uh any any real public scrutiny over over this relationship but and, and can uh, i quickly say four aircraft which cost more than all the treaty of waitangi settlements in new zealand in our entire history yeah yeah it's uh it's it's shockingly uh bad um 
So speaking of um, shockingly bad, um, I wanted to come to you, uh, Tina, and just think about the, the fundamental tension that I think many of us feel when we, when we consider how Aotearoa New Zealand can take positions internationally that might be seen as relatively progressive. And the, the tension between that and our own sense of injustice, ongoing um, injustice at home and things like human rights and things like ongoing colonization. Um, how do you, do you think it's credible for any New Zealand government to take a kind of progressive position on peace, environment, human rights, while injustice remains on these issues at home? Well, I think one of the issues that, um, oh, Malo Leso Soifua, and very much for having me here, and happy Samoan, um, happy Samoan Language Week, and happy Aida Alfitsia. Thank you very much, and it's, it's lovely to be here with you all. Um, just to pick up on one of the strands that um, Nikki was mentioning, you know, I think that is a really excellent kind of seg into the kinds of things that we would need to be considering as a nation in order for us to consider ourselves progressive because being progressive is a subjective idea, right? And, and, and certainly our participation in RIMPAC and the, the types of impacts that RIMPAC has upon our um, upon the environment, the marine environment around the place, but also the violence that, that perpetuates every single time it happens against our Kanaka Maoli Fano in Hawaii as well. The, the crime rates, particularly the sexual crime rates that, es that escalate through our participation in RIMPAC and the holding of RIMPAC in jail are an excellent example of the farce of what it is to be progressive. There was a BBC article out just the other day asking this question, why is New Zealand so progressive? And I'd say there would have been a lot more people than just me reading that headline going, we're progressive, you know, especially a lot of Māori who are still waiting for our land to come back would have been sitting there going, we're progressive. But so it was a very British broadcasting corporation kind of a headline. But, you know, there's always going to be a sense, you know, some kind of injustice or, or another. And the question for me is not whether or not we still have an injustice ongoing in Aotearoa, is do we have a system of injustice? Do we have a system in place, a just system to be able to identify a broad range of what injustice looks like, not just an injustice that, uh, that appears suddenly when it happens to white middle-class New Zealanders, but a recognition of what injustice looks like when it happens right across our board. And so understanding what that system of injustice looks like means that we have to reflect on the nature of injustice as it's occurred right throughout our history. And the longest standing injustice of the nation state of New Zealand is the theft and deceit upon which our nation state is premised. That being in the first instance, the assumption of sovereignty with the application of the doctrine of discovery on our lands. And secondly, being the assumption of sovereignty through the use and the promotion of the fraudulent document that's often referred to as the English version of the Treaty of Hangi. And until we, everything else that comes down from that in terms of our economy, our defense, our security, the way that we govern ourselves, everything that flows down from that is going to continue to perpetuate injustice until we are able to go back and address the injustice of the premise upon which our government is built. And so that for me is when we're going to start having some systemic reckoning with what injustice and therefore what progressiveness actually looks like until we can identify that original injustice and talk about it. And we've never done that as a nation. We've never had a good, strong look at ourselves, at our history, at our government and, and analysed and reported back on the systemic injustice dating right back from its first inception, the systemic injustice that informs the way that we make decisions about power, allocation of power and wealth, and how that informs our international relationships as well. And so, uh, yeah, we, we still need to be able to assess that in order for us to be able to recognize what injustice looks like. Because otherwise, you know, we'll still wind up allowing thing, you know, the, the injustice that's ongoing in West Papua at the hands of the Indonesian military upon our West Papua brothers and sisters, we'll still continue to ignore and allow for or permit the injustice that's being perpetuated against indigenous brothers and sisters on Turtle Island and Navajo Nation, or at Standing Rock, or at Unistoten, or at the Alberta Tarn 
violence or anywhere else that injustice is happening against Indigenous peoples around the world, that we in our very colonially unjust state can need to have blind spots around. And so, and so yeah, the, the, I guess for me, that question for us is that we need to understand our own systems of, of injustice in order to be able to correctly assess and identify injustice as it's happening and then make any kind of a stand about, around what looks to be progressive elsewhere in the world. Mm. Snaps because yes, big head nods from me and from the comments as well. Thank you, Koka Tina, Koka Tina. Um, I was just wondering, um, it's being clarified in the comments, but for people that come back and watch this later, could you just um, explain briefly what RIMPAC is for those who don't know? Sure, so RIMPAC uh, is uh, the world's largest naval military exercise that happens every four years, I believe. Um, and so at the moment, is it every two years or every four years, somebody can correct me, but in any case, it happens very regularly. It happens off the coast of Hawaii, New Zealand and a range of other nations from around the world occur, um, converge there and they carry out military exercises, including the utilization of um, uh, nuclear detonations and microwave de detonations and, and it devastates, it absolutely devastates our marine, um, the marine environment there. It has ongoing ramifications throughout the Pacific for environmental marine health. And of course, and then the and then socially, there is a whole a wide ranging series um, set of socio cultural impacts upon Kanaka Maoli and Hawaii as well. Mm, just kind of, it's kind of a bit disgusting, eh? Like just thinking that so many people get together and do this. It's real disgusting, and we're training to be able to perpetuate this injustice of warfare in other places on the behalf of countries like the USA as well. So it's for a disgusting reason. And mm. a disgusting practice. I, yeah, no, that's pretty, yeah, pretty shocking that that happens. Um, I'm going to move on to um, my question for Guled. So, Tina Kwe, brother, I just was wondering, and welcome to Aotearoa Town Hall. I was wondering if you could um, share your card or your thoughts on how you see New Zealand's kind of orientation towards people coming to live and work here from overseas. Uh, kia ora, um, Tamitha, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Thomas, and everyone else um, for being here. It's such a privilege to be as part of this discussion. Um, Eid Mubarak, of course, to my Muslim whanau and those that celebrated. Um, Talofa Lava, also happy Samoan Language Week. Um, and also, uh, happy Africa Day. Um, it's Africa Day today, you know. It's, uh, the day we celebrate the African unity of, you know, I guess the continent coming together. So it's so fitting that we're here talking about Aotearoa and the world. <laughs> so guys, I think uh, you timed it right. Wasn't sure if that was all intentionally happened or if it just fell into place, but either way, nice one there. Um, look, I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, the conversations that others have had at this corridor. Um, Tina, you know, you talked about injustice and acknowledging um, I guess the, our deep rooted history of colonization and so forth. And I think that's an important place to actually start uh, my response to that question. Um, you know, uh, as I guess migrants and, you know, recent arrivals, um, that is a history of New Zealand. And it's, it's, it's one that I do agree in many ways with Tina that isn't acknowledged enough um, and it isn't discussed enough. I um, mean, obviously, with things like the recent, um, you know, Christchurch mosque massacre and stuff like that have obviously brought those conversations to the forefront. Um, and, uh, you know, I also want to acknowledge uh, what Nino was talking about earlier around the international perception of New Zealand. That is, is something that I've seen in my work, you know, and especially talking about things like injustice and racism and discrimination and everything like that, that really is happening here in New Zealand that still manifests um, in every day, I guess, in different forms and fashions, um, is, is really difficult when you have that international perception of being this, you know, socially harmonious, inclusive nation. I mean, to the point where that we ourselves have really bought into that, um, into this, you know, idea that we're so much better than other countries, um, you know, automatically kind of setting the bar so low for ourselves. Um, which allows us to become complacent in, 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 
and, and not acknowledging our deep rooted history of injustice and so forth. So to basically, you know, in, in short, to answer that question, obviously there is still, you know, our orientation towards migrants and recent arrivals, um, there's room for improvement. Um, you know, we're not necessarily as welcoming as we may think we are. Um, and that's something that I've talked about consistently again and again throughout my own advocacy work. Um, and even with things like, you know, I guess, uh, tragic incidents like Christchurch that have, I guess, become a catalyst for change for many of us who um, are now committed to using, you know, this tragedy to instill change, um, to make sure that, you know, we are all safe as New Zealanders and things like that don't happen again. Um, we still encounter many challenges in terms of even talking about that. Um, and now you throw things like COVID into the mix. <laughs> it's put those conversations completely on the back burner. Um, so those are things that we haven't even still been able to discuss in many ways. Um, you know, I think there's many of us and me, myself included, that I think we moved on quite quickly from having those conversations as well. Um, and that, you know, we are still living a bit in, the, in denial, um, whether we like it or not, um, in many ways. And, and, and things like COVID have obviously um, you know, put conversations like that to the back burner in a way. But I guess, you know, my hope is that we're able to, um, you know, keep the momentum going and have those difficult and courageous and necessary conversations to look at our past and actually talk about the future that we want for ourselves and as a nation um, and, and to work towards creating and shaping um, that society that we want for future generations. Um, and that's one that should be, you know, more welcoming, inclusive, kind, um, on the principles that we, I guess, you know, see for New Zealand. You know, we uh, we like to think of ourselves as a being, you know, a fair, a country that gives people a fair go. Um, and I think for the most part, you know, we are and we have that sort of values instilled in us, but there's certainly a lot of room for improvement. Um, and even things like, you know, when it's already so difficult to talk about this and then you throw in a pandemic into the situation, um, it becomes difficult for you to even talk about your perspectives. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that my community has faced, the Muslim community was, um, you know, during level four lockdown, the issue of halal meat and its accessibility and so forth. Um, you know, we weren't even allowed to have a conversation without actually receiving so much backlash as a community, so much hate, like, why don't you just go vegetarian? Like, you know, aren't you part of this, this team was 5 million uh, <laughs> and it's like hey it's just a simple thing that we're just trying to raise that maybe nobody thought of you know um for obvious reasons because of lack of representation and things like that so look we've got a long way to go and i feel like things like covid and stuff like that have um put a bit of a span in the works, as they might say, um, but we have an opportunity to, um, you know, use platforms and occasions and things like this, um, like Aotearoa Town Hall, to be able to continue those conversations. So, um, kia ora. Kia ora, Guled. I think it's so valuable that we have your voice, not just here tonight, but in society at large. And it's quite, I mean, this sound, might sound patronising, it's not meant to be, but it's quite brave in a way, I think to to do what you're doing and because there's a lot i know there's a lot of criticism um and so i really you know i really respect that and um yeah total thank you thomas um so uh next question i'm going to go to my dear friend and colleague evelyn dr evelyn masters and I just i kind of want to bring you in to talk about what the organization new zealand alternative is where did it come from and can you just describe what it is obviously i i know what it is because i'm a part of it but uh maybe for the for the audience and for, for for all of us it sounds a bit silly asking you but given i know the answer to it but yeah anyway over to you kia ora hey thank you for that thomas and before i kick off i just want to say i might take my time with answering this question because my head is sort of full of listening um, and it's been an amazing conversation so far and I feel very humble to be a part of this conversation and thank you all for your honesty and bravery. I think everybody <laughs> has said some rather controversial and at times radical um, things. So thank you for that. So about the New Zealand Alternative, I think it's kind of the perfect forum to talk about, about what we do because 
the whole purpose of the New Zealand alternative is to ignite these types of public debates around foreign policy. Um, it was started in 2018. Thomas and Nina Hall, who are on the panel tonight, were some of the founding members. We also have Max Harris, that's part of our team. We, Laura O'Connor Raipera was part of the steering group originally and helped set this up. And um, we have Dr. Adamo Rata as well, who's part of our crew. And we've just recently grown to the point where we've been able to bring on two amazing managers. We've got Erin Mapareki and Phoebe Carr. So we're an organization that basically we're all mates. We all think about foreign policy in different ways. We have very diverse points of view. It, it, sometimes we don't agree. But basically the co-papa is that we put our attention towards creating a platform that's diverse and inclusive and allows us to talk about foreign policy and New Zealand's role in the world. And by that, I mean a really honest look at New Zealand's role in the world. And I think we've had some different perspectives tonight around you know, perhaps the positive and the negative um, and perhaps also making sure that whatever our image is internationally, that we're thinking about whether or not that is consistent with what's actually happening domestically in New Zealand, right? So my interest in the New Zealand alternative is, it's kind of personal. Um, I have always been interested in foreign policy. I don't have a PhD in foreign policy, um, but I've always had a very outward orientation to my interest in the world. And my understanding of my own identity as a New Zealand born Cook Islander has always been one of standing in one place, but looking outwards and finding connections. And I have found throughout the time um, that the conversation about foreign policy is often incredibly elitist and Nikki Hager brought this up beautifully and said it far more eloquently than I could, but it's often entangled in codes. There's often smoke screens used to disguise some really, you know, abhorrent policies and behaviors on behalf of international governments. And I think that turns people off talking about New Zealand's role in the world and turns people off thinking about, okay, so what is foreign policy? How do we understand it? What do we stand up for? How does that work with our own value systems? You know, do, are we in line with what New Zealand is doing overseas? And so that's my interest in the, in the New Zealand alternative and why I jumped on board to help Thomas direct the kaupapa because I really believe that for a conversation to be inclusive, we have to take out the jargon um, we have to talk about it in creative ways using, you know, animation or short policy briefs or using art to really bring the conversation into the New Zealand home, right? So basically we do two main things. We run hui, which at the moment are obviously sort of in virtual by nature, but um, usually we will partner with another like-minded organization and have these types of conversations with the public. And we've also uh, produced some policy briefs and we have some more policy briefs coming out this year. And I think although the topics of the policy briefs were designed pre-COVID-19, they kind of all stack up against the weak spots we had recognized in our foreign policy thinking. Um, so just some examples include uh, thinking about a way that New Zealand could advocate for a fossil free, uh, fossil, fossil fuel free treaty. Um, also, my interest is in advocating for um, independence of Pacific states, um, including the realm states of the Cook Islands, Nui and Tokelau. Um, we also have a lovely piece coming out, which is about reimagining economic policy and how New Zealand could be a leader in that realm. So, I mean, but feel free, Thomas and Nina, to, to jump in and contribute to this because it definitely is a, it's a collaboration. It's by no means just me. Anything to say? No? Thanks. Thanks, Evelyn. That's a really good, um, good description and a good little primer on, on the work of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have anything to add. Uh, Tam, it's uh, you next, I think. Yes. It is. And thank you for that, Evelyn. I totally agree with what you're saying. It has to be accessible. People have to understand what we're talking about. But also, I know that 
understanding our place as a country in the world, I think is also a gateway to understanding ourselves too, because I know when I was at school, I was really interested in other countries and other histories because we weren't taught about our own history, you know, at all. And so I was really interested and then I dove into that and then I thought, oh, well, all these countries have treaties. Do we have our own treaty? And then it kind of, you know, sparks that curiosity, I think, as well. So, um, no, great subject and great, great cope up on New Zealand alternative. I think it's awesome and really, really good to understand what, what role we play in the world. Um, and now I'm going to move on to Sean. Sean, it's really good to meet you um, face to face over Zoom. I've only seen your tweets and some of the things you've um, written. So it's awesome to be able to hear a bit more from you this evening. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a question about um, the book that you wrote with, I think, Sir Paul Callaghan about how New Zealand could evolve our economy and, and get off the grass. I quite like that um, that uh, terminology um so I was just wondering like do you see an opportunity for us um to do that now and and have an influence on other countries uh, kia ora and ta uh, uh, um, um uh yeah I mean it's yeah, get off the grass <laughs> yeah I mean I think coming back to get off the grass I mean I think um if I if, if I'd had a subtitle if I was writing a post-covid subtitle it, it would be you know how Blind faith in markets has created a, a fragile economy. <laughs> and I guess we're all about to find out how fragile the, the, the economy that we have built is. Um, you know, part of, part of what we looked at and get off the grass was, was just how specialised New Zealand's economy was compared to other um, advanced economies around the world. And by specialised, I mean, you know, there's very few things that we trade with the world, right? We, we do it in volume. Um, but we, we don't do much in variety at all. And, and it's only Australia um, that's, that's more specialised in that way than we are in the OECD. Um, and I, I don't know if, 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 you know, average person understands that or appreciates that, um, especially if you're sort of living in, a, in urban New Zealand. Um, it's, it's probably more evident in rural New Zealand, but in urban New Zealand, you know, we look, the cities here look a bit like the cities we, we might see in Europe. Um, the same sort of activities, but the things that we're trading with the world are just are heavily, heavily specialised around one or two things. And of course, you know, one of those big things is tourism. Um, and over the next couple of years, that's that's going to be something that's hit very hard. So that was that was that was one observation we made in the book that that actually that was a very risky thing to bet our, our, our well-being on one or two activities. And and then the other thing that we we looked at when we um, uh, you know, we, we looked at the New Zealand economy, it was al almost everything was based on extractive industries, right? We, we, we get value um, from our environment, right? We exploit our environment to make our, to make our living. Um, and of course, you know, extractive industries, um, you know, the, the, the unjust industries, right? The, the, as, as Tina said, right? We're, we're um, uh, Using uh, the the land here to, um, uh, uh, to to make money and to to navigate our wealth our, our way through the world, and it's you know it's 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 that land is not in in, um, in the right people's hands, right? It's not not uh, uh, owned by the Tangata Whenua, and so so that was a that was a, a really um, key observation in the book, and so so the book was really it was about how do you get out of that that place? You know, we've, we're a settler colonial um, uh, country. How do how do we move towards something that's that's more, more diverse in terms of, of the things that we do, um, and that's not extractive? And our argument was um, was about a, developing a knowledge based economy. Um, and so we you know we needed to invest in, in knowledge. And I think I think you know that was that, that was that was a book from 2013, and sort of reflecting you know that's that's I mean I, we wrote it in 2012, and so it's sort of eight years since we put pen to paper um, and and you know the government has listened to, to some aspects of it and so now if you look at, it, at where our science funding goes most of it most of it will come with a tag well we need to you know we need to create knowledge-based exports um, but when you you know but overall our, our sort of our the, our the knowledge capital that we're generating um, through these investments is very heavily specialized simply on economic value right and I think that's actually something um, when we reflect on how we've navigated through the COVID crisis, 
I think we're going to have to good, have a good hard look at ourselves at whether we had the right knowledge assets here in, in New Zealand, um, and 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 you know, and how much value public good research creates. And you know, public good research gets you through this type of of crisis. It's not that very narrowly focused um, uh, economic based uh, research that does it. And so that's you know, and and and. You know, the previous government was very focused on the economy, and actually, that's that's been carried on by the current government. Most of the science funding is 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 still directed towards economic goals. So that's kind of that that yeah. So my subtitle is you know is is around that fragility of of the economy that we have today. I mean, thank you, Sean. Lots of positive. Um comments around that too so thank you um, for that so what we're going to do now is we're going to move into I mean I thought those were some pretty mean answers as well for for quick fire questions but we're going to move into I guess a bit more specialized questions now just to really get dig into some of the content that we've already touched on already this evening um, and so I thought a good place to start is um, with you know in our own backyard and thinking about the constitutional foundations of this country and um, kind of what kind of a role that and how that kind of interacts with the rest of the world and um, so the first question is for Tina and I thought a Tetiriti question would, would set the set the foundation really really well so obviously some of our tipuna traveled um, traveled a lot obviously traveling to get here in the first instance and then um, traveling all around actually over to Aussie and to England in different circumstances um, but obviously there's also um, a lot of stats that I see coming up um, you know some of the popular ones are that Indigenous people make up I think it's like eight percent of the world but have like 80 percent of uh, native biodiversity within their custodianship or something I've probably got the numbers wrong but uh, what I'm saying here is I think, um, you know, as Indigenous people, we're, we're a part of a, a wider international collective. Um, but I was just wondering, um, Tina, what you thought um, foreign policy might look like in Aotearoa if te tiriti was the um, kind of thing underpinning everything? Kia ora. Um, I, so, so the figures I think you're referring to, we, we Indigenous peoples account for um, less than 5% of the world population, and we are operating on less than one-fifth of our traditional territories, but within that one-fifth of our traditional territories, we look after 80% of the world's biodiversity, and in 2017, within our forests that we manage, we sequestered 33 times the global CO2 emissions. And so there's something really powerful in those types of figures around the value of indigenous frameworks and how they can inform not only our domestic issues, but can inform solutions for the world if that is potentiated. But unfortunately, because we are so often left to have to fight our own battles ourselves because we so rarely have uh, the camaraderie and the solidarity from nation states. And often that's because the nation states are premised upon keeping us in an oppressed state and because they benefit from the very imperialism that, that creates the problem in the first place so they tend to perpetuate it. We're not able to potentiate those solutions but it's a really important aspect to consider in relation to your question because um, you know, understanding, and I guess just to, to bring it right back, one of the first things that we have to accept is that when we did sign Te Tiriti o Waitangi, there, was, there were two documents. There was a, a Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and then there was another document that people refer to as the Treaty of Waitangi. And, um, and out of 525 signatures, 505 of those signatures were on Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And, um, and, and, that, and that document says something very different to the document that upon which the government is premised, which is that sovereignty still sit with the tangata whenua of, of this land. And, and we can look at it almost as a kind of a tenancy agreement upon which, that, that was the agreement upon which we agreed to continue to allow, um, you know, people who were not from here to come here and settle here. And so if we accept that, and if we accept that under common international law, uh, through many, through many aspects of common international law, Te Tiriti o Waitangi is the document that should be acknowledged, then that gives us a, a, the proper starting point for this conversation around what um, our international policy should look like. And one of those premises is mana kite mana, 
So Māori, we have always, as you pointed out, Tamatha, we, we had international relationships that predate Tiriti, and those international relationships existed with our whānau across Te Moana Nui Akiwa. And, we've, and we continue to have to grow our own international relationships. We had our own trade economy as well. We were excellent traders and negotiators, as many of the early European invaders quickly found out that we could negotiate rings around them. And so... Um, and so, you know, it's really a question of what would it look like if we had Te Tiriti or Waitangi embedded here, then it would be a completely different way of governing ourselves, our way of representing ourselves would look different, and the relationships that we would create overseas based upon that space of justice would be different as well. So for me, mana ki te mana uh, infers a relationship that occurs between my mana as, it's relate, as it relates between myself and my land and the mana of an indigenous person on Great Turtle Island as it relates between them and their land. And the relationships that we have, that we negotiate with each other that are based upon their experience and their needs and their membership of the same global indigenous community that I belong to as well. So there are some very different conversations that we would be having in relation to West Papua, in relation to Hawaii, in relation to Te Moana Nui Akiwa. And, you know, when you look at our trade deals like PESA Plus and the way in which PESA Plus is still unbalanced and tends to um, <clears throat> perpetuate oppression of peoples across Te Moana Nui Akiwa as well, we have a relationship, a long-standing relationship that would inform our responsibilities of our negotiations between us and the mana and sovereigns of this land and the people who hold the mana and the sovereignty and the lands that they are living in across across um, Te Moana Nui Akiwa as well. It would also inform the way in which we engage, again, I have to come back to, to RIMPAC and, and the war games that are being played out there and the fact that we will participate in an exercise that sends 26,000 troops from around the world in the middle of a COVID crisis to Hawaii and some of them have already tested positive for COVID as well. And then, and what that, and you know, just the audacity that we would have to do that and the way in which that contributes to a situation of ongoing injustice around the world for the, the preparations for war that's going on around the world and how that informs the movement of peoples and, and you know, denies them the right to stay safely at home in their lands, forces them to become refugees, and then we have the gall to treat them the way that we do treat them when we've forced them to relocate in the first place. So, you know, I think if we were to um, to, to look at Te Tiriti Waitangi, to look at the values and, and, and the provisions within that document um, and recognise what justice would look like, both from an international but just a general moral standpoint that that is the document that was signed by our ancestors, and then look at what that mean that would what that would mean in terms of how we're represented and how that would inform our relationships internationally. It would also free up a whole lot of time and space that sense of justice for us to be able to potentiate what we have to offer as far as the solutions go. It would make us truly progressive because then we could call upon other countries to also be looking at their ind the, the indigenous justice in their lands and every time we free up space for indigenous knowledge to be able to contribute to global well-being we're taking some of the strongest climate actions you can take we're taking some of the strongest biodiversity protection actions that you can take and there are global ramifications for it kia ora Kia ora, Tina. It's, it's so, um, somebody in the comments earlier said it's soothing for the soul to hear these words. And I do feel that myself, actually, that grappling with these issues, it's, it's, so, it's so hard. And, and it is, it's just to hear some, some clarity and wisdom. And it's, it's extremely, it is soothing. And, and I, I really feel so grateful for, for your time and, and, and wisdom. And I think you're just just reflecting on this a bit, and I'm going to go to you, Nikki, next. But if anyone wants to like jump in at any point during once we get to this part of the quarter, or we tend to be a little bit more free flowing. So if people want to, you know, grab the mic, you know, just unmute yourself, and I'll I'll see that you've you've unmuted. Um, but yeah, I wanted to say just before coming to you, Nikki, and I'm going to pick up some some comments and questions in the um, uh, in, in in the chat there. Uh, but I feel like there is there is this responsibility 
you you've laid out how Te Tiriti or Waitangi could could be the foundation of our foreign policy and how, how beneficial that would be for so many things. And I feel like I feel responsibility as as you know as Toiwi as Tangata Tiriti to to do my bit to to help make that the case as well as of course the responsibility and the that that you are already taking as Tangata Whenua in in many different ways. So I think it's it's important to for for us to recognize that for me to recognize that uh, as well. Um, so Nikki, people, there's a there's a there's a theme coming up in the comments about uh, our abusive relationship with the United States as a country, and how do we? And I think it relates to you know what you were saying, Tina, and what a lot of uh, what we've been saying um, relates to as well. And someone's someone's suggesting I mean, it was Adama Adama who suggested you know how do we get out of this abusive relationship, um, Nikki, and someone else has suggested long couples therapy, um, especially given the name of the. Uh, person in charge uh, in the United States. But I wonder, Nikki, what, what, what would you say to this question of how, how we do get out of this abusive relationship that we seem to have with the United States as a country? Thank you for asking me that. <clears throat> I've, I've, as I've been listening to other people talking, thank you to all of you. I'm enjoying it. Two ideas are in my mind at the moment. And the first one is about generally how political change happens in a country. And this is about having an optimistic view about things when there are forces that we don't agree with and there's institutions which resist change. But the important idea I think we should remember is that a country is not one person. A country doesn't have one person who has one idea in their head or maybe two confused ideas. A country is made up of a whole lot of different people at the same time. And maybe sometimes it can be we can be stuck. We can seem like we all, you know, New Zealand thinks something or other, but actually most people have already moved on. Or lots of people have moved on, or people will, move, or people are latently moved on. And if they just heard people expressing a different point of view, that's actually where they are as a person. And so I think we should recognise that we're in a state of change. We're in a great historic, huge state of change where we were a colony. We have a colonial mentality. And although our institutions are slower to change than the public, the public changes all the time. And people who speak up and who are talking about things and groups that raise issues and people who write books about the economics of it and all the rest of it, that change is going on. It's just gradually going on and you can't stop it because there's all these other people who don't have to agree with the status quo. First thing I want to say. The other thing I want to say is about what looking at what a country like ours can contribute in the world, which I think helps to point at where we, what we should be doing. And the idea I want to put here is that when we come to international relations as opposed to our internal politics, we do very well to remember that we are a micro state. We're almost a kind of like a city state. We are tiny. We're only the size, of, our whole country is the size of some medium sized cities in other countries. We're, we're not important, we're far away. And when we, for example, when we, and I wish that our military had a stronger sense of this, when we, when we go off and join an American-led coalition, our contribution is approximately zero. Zero planes, practically zero, practically zero ships. We are so small, we are, if we want to make our way in the world according to our alliance contributions, we are, dreaming, we are fooling ourselves, we are almost nothing. But what, the, what, our, hist what our history and our experiences have shown us is that New Zealand, oddly, can have a substantial effect. We're having it at the moment by giving hope and a different picture to people around the world on COVID-19. And we've done it on various things in our history. And that means you don't have to be big. This is the Norman Kirk idea, the Norman Kirk being the 1970s Labour Prime Minister who talk about New Zealand as a principled small nation and how powerful a principled small nation can be when it speaks up. I, I believe that what we see can see New Zealand do is speaking up on things and being different. And so for, just to give a random example, on climate change, when we have climate change discussions, we have a kind of inward looking view on that, I think. We talk about what we could do to reduce our um, farming emissions or something. But actually, we should be thinking much bigger than that. We should be thinking, what is the main example that we could set as a country which would be noticed elsewhere? Because frankly, our emissions don't matter a damn. They're not going to stop anything melting anywhere, relatively. 
And, but what we do have is we've got this moral power. And the reason for that, I'm just saying things so wrong, but the reason for that is because we're so far from the world's conflicts, because we don't have um, a conflict with our, just across, you know, a military conflict across our border, because we don't, we're not overwhelmed with the, with the you know, the destructive results of wars in the Middle East or something. We're, we're a remarkably free and independent country, potentially. We actually have the ability to speak up in ways which our foreign policy leaders often don't take the chance of, speak up on things where the world needs someone prepared to speak up. And so our funny little micro state in the south of the South Pacific has huge potential to help to change the world. And the main thing that holds us back is old funny ideas about who our real friends are in the world. And then after that, just our own limitations on what we think is possible. Kia ora, Nikki. It's gonna, um, yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. I, I totally agree with you that there is this, this sort of latent capacity to be a, be a positive force in, in, the, in the world. I was gonna actually come back to you, Nikki, on that and just ask, you know, given you've been at loggerheads with the New Zealand government about our international engagements, you know, particularly in relation to the to the Defence Force and the and the SAS. I mean, when you look at all of that, I mean, you've answered it a bit in in those previous remarks, but you 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 look at that and you still you still do feel in your heart of hearts that we can be a force, a genuine force for good in the world. Oh, totally. I think that our the way I view New Zealand, my, my um, simplistic view of New Zealand, which is my not, and it's a non one person view, is that we have two, I've, I've, someone might, some of you may have heard me say this before, but I think it's like it's really important. We have two really major competing visions of who we are as a country. And one of them is that, wow, the colonial you know ridiculously long ago colonial reasons we're part of the five eyes alliance and while we punch above our weight and aren't we important little nobodies in a terrifying alliance is one view and the other view is we are a modern increasingly uh south pacific oriented just kind of a country we're not there by any means yet but we we've got if you look at the population of the country the country's going somewhere different the country likes being nuclear free the country likes us speaking up on things which other countries aren't free enough and or or democratic enough or whatever it takes to be able to do that far enough away from the world's problems. And I believe that there's many more people in that big river of the second track who want us to be a different kind of country. So we've got massive potential and it just needs to be talked up and led and then now and then be lucky enough to have governments that will do something about it. Tina, jump in. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying, um, Nikki, around, you know, we, we have created a, a somewhat of a model and, and you can't help though, but reflect on this mass communicative power that our country has been able to, that our government has been able to harness, to be able to affect broad change across, across the nation. And I know a lot of people have kind of gone wow you know that's amazing at what we've been able to do now let's do it for climate change or let's do it so let's do it for that but what one of the things that they you know we haven't been able to maintain obviously that lock the the, the winds that we've gotten through lockdown and it was only a four-week period but you know we, but what we can do is that we can look at what we've been able to achieve over the last four weeks and consider how we might apply that across these broader issues particularly how it relates to injustice and you know when i when i even globally around the world, all of these factors that have made us really vulnerable to COVID are also many of these factors that make us vulnerable to climate change. And that's, again, something that's not escaped a lot of people's notice, but a lot of people's attention. But you have this, you know, this dichotomy of imperialism. And so all of those factors around the individualization of profit and, uh, and moving away from communal ways of being and this consolidation of power within a single kind of a power base and the extraction of resources for profit of, of a small group of people. All of these things sit within this paradigm of imperialism and the antithesis of imperialism is indigenous ways of being and knowing and doing. And so if we, if we are going to look at, you know, for me, 
you know, from my perspective, if we're going to start looking at things that make us more climate resilient, but also more COVID resilient and more resilient as communities, we can't get, we can't escape from the central core driver of of these weaknesses and vulnerabilities being uh, colonialism and imperialism and how those things operate to drive war, to drive extraction, to drive injustice at a global level. And the areas that we contribute to as a nation through our participation in the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and the World Trade Organization, which is founded upon the theft of indigenous resources and indigenous money being extracted out of indigenous lands. And it's still perpetuated today as well. So it's only going to happen, you know, we have this, this rise of the global right uh, with Bolsonaro, with Trump, with Johnson, Morin, and, and I absolutely not people, then it's not one person. There are hundreds of thousands or millions of people that support. So what's going on with us at a social level, why we have these huge amounts of support for this ideology that is so extractive, that is so destructive, that is so racist and so harmful. And how do we take from this mass communication, the, the mass communication strategy that Tirol was able to roll out across our nation to be able to get such fantastic results for COVID and apply that to a sense of justice, how we pursue justice and how we get people to reject these ideas of the right of extraction of imperialism and then have that be the model that enforce how we can work together at a global level as well. Mm. And just on that, oh, sorry. No, you go, Nina, sorry. I was just going to jump in briefly because um, I'm so enjoying this conversation, listening to everyone, but building on what both Tina and Nikki have said about our alliances, I wonder if, and this is a, a conversation that's happening more broadly internationally, COVID will be a trigger for rethinking some of our traditional alliances in New Zealand. Because as Nikki pointed out, you know, the traditional alliances are the US, the UK, and we know these are the countries that have done the worst at dealing with COVID. It's very, very clear to us in terms of these are leaders that not only can't think internationally and about their responsibilities, they can't care for their own citizens. I mean, we've got literally thousands of people who have died because of the ineffectiveness of these governments. Yeah. And I just wonder, not being in New Zealand, whether that conversation will take off as people reflect on, well, if these are, why are we allying with these countries? These are, these are led by people that are ineffective um, at thinking about public health and COVID. So, you know, what, what, what kind of trust can we put in them if we're trying to develop strong relationships? Now, that's, of course, the leaders. I don't want to suggest that we can't have other forms of relationships, whether it be Indigenous peoples, like Tina has pointed out, within the US or, or across many other countries in, in Brazil. Um, but I do think there's a real uh, sense within the international community that we may see some realignment. And the question, I think, here for us to think about as, as New Zealanders, um, and everyone listening in, you know, it's not just for us as panelists, it's, well, who would we look to then? What are the countries or the communities? And we've had a few suggestions, but I think it's really interesting also, you know, thinking about the Pacific, thinking about Asia, countries like Taiwan, there've been a lot of really interesting ideas about other small countries, whether it be in Europe, that have been really effective at dealing with COVID, but also maybe share more similar values than the UK or the US. So I just wanted to throw that in as well. Yeah, Nina, kia ora, thank you for that. I think I just, as a segue, just after something that you mentioned, um, you know, I do think we often tend to look particularly in the developing nations as nations for, I guess, inspiration and so forth, um, and, and being able to draw success stories from that part. But you know what, also, I think there's some here at home it, here that we have and potential that I feel like, you know, is there and that we could tap into um, further, uh, you know, for example, um, this, we all agree there's so much suffering and, you know, so much like just disasters, just horrible things happening all around the world. Um, and I, you know, in many ways, I, you know, I feel despite obviously acknowledging all the injustice that still exists in this country, I feel blessed and lucky to be in New Zealand, you know, um, and, and I'm proud to be a Kiwi in that sense. Um, and, but, and I feel like there's an opportunity there for us to be a beacon of hope for the rest of the world um, and to actually lead um, and be seen 
in terms of how our perception that we have right globally to actually and in other words what i'm trying to say is in order for us to do that we need to be able to practice what we preach um we need to practice what we preach about kindness we need to practice what we preach about you know like when we say they are us you know we can't continue to still block you know put barriers in front of people and stuff like that so we can be a beacon of hope for the rest of the world and i feel like there's an opportunity there for us to be able to lead in that space but really we have to start practicing what we're preaching because we're not really doing it if i'm honest with you um and you know when i think about things like in terms of um, the things that I'm grateful for, um, you know, living in New Zealand and our beautiful, you know, indigenous culture. And I guess that sense of manakitanga, that value of hospitality and whatnot, that is a perfect foundation to be able to start place. I feel like, you know, obviously in, in a way it allows us to fulfill our obligation in terms of upholding the treaty, but also it allows us to harness um, some of that positive, I guess, you know, uh, cultural values that we do hold as a nation to be able to lead um, globally and be seen as a welcoming, you know, harmonious um, society. At the same time, it allows us to, um, you know, actually, for, it allows Māori for them to have their rightful stake in that debate, in that conversation about, you know, welcoming people as well. And things like immigration, um, you know, I was listening to Evelyn talk about the need for, I guess, how we look at foreign policy and so forth and reshape all of that. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's, there's, there's stuff here, there's inspiration here that we have on, on, on our home base, but we just need to be able to um, capitalize on it. And I don't necessarily think that we are, but at the same time, we've done some great stuff. And, you know, um, around the world, there's still so much tragedy, like just about a week ago, you know, there's been confirmed cases of COVID in the largest refugee camp in the world. Those people do not have ability to socially distance, okay? So, so it's crazy to think what is going to be happening in that environment. Yet, you know, obviously we've closed our borders to keep ourselves safe and rightfully so. But how are we still, um, I guess, um, sharing our share of, you know, easing the global burden um, on other less privileged people, but doing it in a way that is safe as well? Because I really feel like we can do both. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be an either or all. So there's like those sorts of conversations that we also need to be having if we're really talking about New Zealand's place currently here out there or in our place in the world, um, and particularly in this current circumstances, because, you know, um, I've heard that phrase, it's, you know, extraordinary circumstances so many times over several weeks. But it really is that I feel like there's a lot that, you know, we could be um, leading in that area as well. And on that, actually, Gurleta. Oh, sorry, Sean. Yeah, no. Yep, you go. <laughs> I was about. Yeah, I should just. I'll pick up on that, and then then something that that Tina was talking about as well. So I mean, yeah, you know, COVID is a is a disease that um, thrives on in inequity, right? I mean, that that's that's how it works, um, and and that is that's infectious disease, right? And 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 I think, you know, one of the things I want to do coming out of this is just reflect on why. Why, you know, in New Zealand, our field in New Zealand, we've 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 let infectious disease um, run run rampant um, uh, in many communities without without really caring. It was only, you know, it's really taken this uh, event to put it on our radar. And and if you want to COVID your pro pro COVID proof yourself, you 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 fight inequality and inequity right in, in the country. And then just yeah, I, I was really. Um, Picking up on, on, on Tina's point about this, the, the the value of you know the communication, this massive communication exercise that we've just been through, and sort of having been part of it, um, and uh, and and how it how it felt to be part of that compared to things I've been pushing for a long time, like climate change. <laughs> you know, you, it felt like climate change. You consider you you push and you push and you push, and and yes, you know, slowly things change, and then suddenly this crisis came along, and suddenly. You push and everything changes um and you know and and, and why that was um and I, and I think we have to remember you know that that when 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 we've been fighting against um climate change um you know there, there's powerful enemies out there there's there's powerful forces that do not want us to change right and and i very much have a sense now sort of coming coming off the end of of, of a couple of months of a lot of communication around covid that we just caught some of those forces unprepared, <laughs> you know, 
the 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 disinformation campaigns um you know they're starting to become more prevalent right we're starting to see bots pushing misinformation through new zealand social media we'll see people talking about how we overreacted soon um and and those that that the the forces that stop us changing will come will will regather and come back um and so so we really do have to learn the lesson from this experience that 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 we you know when we've got opportunities we've got to take them and we've got to move quickly um and uh and and not get caught up and 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 you know in the sticky webs that are built to really hold us in, in the status quo Sean, there's some there's some absolute zingers in there and um that we're gonna clip out and share later i'm sure it's 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 so true though i think we you know the idea that if you want to covid proof yourself you deal with inequality i mean it's absolutely right Evelyn. i want to i want to bring you in and i, I know you've got heaps to say and yeah so I'll, I'll just i'll just kick the ball over to you okay no that's good hey thanks thomas yeah really eager i think because the conversation is so amazing and when thomas and i were talking about this this theme for this conversation i was quite aware that for me the worst fear that i have is that we lose this moment in time um, before rebuilding and post lockdown to not really think about the learnings and to not really think about what worked well and what didn't work well and what worked well in New Zealand, how could that perhaps influence people's change overseas um, and what didn't work well, you know, like who, who didn't we reach with our Unite, you know, campaigns and I'm really nervous that now the discourse is all about rebuilding, getting out of lockdown and, you know, getting the you know, economy back up and running. And it's like, well, hang on. We actually went through something pretty major on a, you know, on a personal, a community and a societal and a global scale. If we don't just pause now and think about what happened and why it happened, where those weaknesses were in our systems to allow this to happen, then that opportunity is lost and then we learn nothing. And so we can't really think about redesigning, you know, any economic system or, or, or think about, you know, how can we be more resilient until we just pause and think, what actually just happened? Like, what did we just go through? Why did it happen? I think Thomas brought me into this conversation because I have this enduring interest in the Cook Islands because I'm a Cook Islander. Um, and we have a very mobile uh, population. We leave very transnational livelihoods. They, these transnational livelihoods facilitate the way we live, the way we structure our families, the way we share resources. And, and in fact, right now, our freedom of movement to New Zealand as New Zealand citizens has been really, you know, really, really restricted. And this has had lots of personal consequences and lots of economic consequences for a lot of people. But I think instead of sort of delving into travel restrictions, I want to pick up a little bit about what everybody's been talking about, which is really understanding and reinterrogating the relationships that we're involved in as New Zealanders, right? And so I think the COVID-19 situation for me has really shone the light on where those strong and value-based relationships are that I, I want to think about positively and perhaps grow and maintain and where the weak ones are and the ones that are disabling and don't fit with the values that I would like to see um, New Zealand promote. So uh, here's an example. I like examples because they, they help people understand. Um, at the moment, New Zealand's trade agreements promote the import and exportation of health demoting foods around the Pacific, foods that are non-nutritious, and at the same time, we put all this money into trying to combat NCDs, okay? So at this moment in time, do those relationships make sense? Well, I mean, no, they make absolutely no sense whatsoever. And so why aren't we reconsidering them? And why aren't we rethinking them? I mean, has COVID-19 taught us that our food systems can be local and that our food systems can be health promoting and that we don't need these trade agreements i mean that these are the kinds of conversations i want to have before we start thinking about where we're going to next 
So awesome. I love the the food sovereignty theme. We're definitely going to have to have a, a food sovereignty corridor at some point on the Aotearoa Town Hall because, yeah, Tam, you did a, a post on this earlier and it just went, um, yeah, got a lot of, uh, got a lot of play. Um, where are we? And yeah, Tina, um, we're coming to you. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, just again, I think probably the, the what it's shown us and what it's taught and the thing that we can do from this point on is to continuously bring ourselves back to what we can, what we are able to do and, and what our women have been able to demonstrate that it can do. And in a sense, it's quite painful when you consider what they have continuously, continuously told us for so long now that we can't do. I mean, looking back, you know, at the at, looking back at the past, we have this was these were decisions that were made and a strategy that was rolled out to avoid to avoid high mortality rates within Aotearoa, right? And Maori have been experiencing high mortality rates since whenever, however long. Like the region that I live in, you you will die. You're six times more likely to die an early preventable death than anywhere else in Aotearoa. And we still can't get funding to get a fully functional health system within our region. And you know, you, our suicide rates outstrip most places in the world, alone within Aotearoa as well. And so, for for a young Maori men, we we have unacceptably high, and we still have a huge amount of underinvestment in addressing these issues of the highlights within Maori. And then we see this incredible strategy get rolled out across the nation and suddenly everybody else's mortality rates comes into question. And it's something that's inspirational, but it also hurts. Hurts like hell when you have watched the mortality rates of your own people skyrocket for generations and generations. And it leaves us also with that continuous challenge around the government that we need to place back in front of the government to say okay well what now that you've shown what you can do let's see you, what you're going to be able to do to address these outstanding mortality rates within a situation of justice under te tiriti or waitangi and your obligations towards maori on this land but it also makes us gives us an opportunity to say well how are you going to roll that that strategy out against the extinction level event that is climate change COVID-19 is terrible but it's not an extinction level event Climate change is an extinction level event. And that's where we need to also be challenging the government to be able to roll out these types of really powerful outcomes that they have just demonstrated that they can do. Never let them forget what they are capable of achieving as they've demonstrated in a couple of months. Kia ora, Tina. I, I know it's your turn next, Tam, but I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to pick up on that and say just this morning, there was a report that there's been a dramatic spike in cases of rheumatic fever in Wellington. And where are the cases all coming from? They're coming from Porirua and the Hutt Valley, um, which are lower socioeconomic areas. And, and it's no surprise. So I think this is, it is so important that we, that we talk about these things and that we recognize that we do have the power, like you say, nothing is, we can't, they don't have an excuse to say it's impossible or we can't do it or it's too much money or, you know, it's, there's the, it's clear now that we can do it if we want to, it's a political decision. I wasn't sure if Nikki was on unmute because you wanted to add to that corded or Nikki or you good. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure it's completely coming right on at the end, but what I've been thinking about while we've been talking is is about what it, it's back to the subject of what it takes to change things like this, and and I think one of the really big features of foreign policy, outwards looking New Zealand and the world issues, is how many people are giving leadership on them and how many people are thinking about them. And we've got we've obviously got New Zealand alternative with us today. But what I would say is that if you if you could kind of get a, an amazing machine that satellites orbits around the earth and look at the our country and see how many people are thinking about foreign policy and what our relationship should be with other countries. We're at a real low point on that. We've got the paid people who will say we're very lucky to have our long-standing relationships with our natural partners and our historic backgrounds and blah, 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 all that stuff. We've talked about that. But people who are actually plotting out 
what is the most constructive way that we can make a difference to the huge issues in the world given our natural advantages and all the rest of it? Not enough people. That's what I would like to, that's, that's the main thing I think about when I hear us talking about this is that there's, it's all opportunity because I don't think the public is away from this. I think that the reception that our government has got by believing in fact-based policy, which was a big issue in the world at the moment or in many countries, and doing the right thing on COVID, that's, that's the potential support for whatever initiatives people wanted to promote, I think. And, and, and the main, so the main thing is not that, yes, there's the resistance of the bureaucracy and the old guard, but there are not that many of them. But the main thing that I think is limited is not the people, the ordinary old folks, the millions of New Zealanders who think about things or don't think about things according to what's going on in the news and who's speaking up. The main limitation is the leadership. And I think if, if we care about these things then what we should be doing is we should be thinking, what will it take to have many more leaders and many more people speaking up on the most important issues because change is possible here. With a change is ripe to happen. And the, I would argue the main thing missing is that, is that articulating and leading on it. I mean, I'm just doing that 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 little pause, just don't want to interrupt someone as I have multiple times. Aroha mai. Did anybody want to add on to that um, cordial train? Yeah, I'll jump in quickly because um, for me, that's really a big part of why I got involved with the New Zealand Alternative with, with Thomas and Evelyn and, and wanting to stir up exactly what Nikki is saying, these kind of conversations and thinking differently about what it is we could be doing, um, not just through the government, but as people, you know, on this panel have pointed out, like Tina, through other connections, whether it be with Indigenous alliances. And um, I don't know if now's a good time, but just to, to highlight one of the other things that we'll be doing with New Zealand Alternative is there should be a book coming out in the next couple of months with Bridget Williams Books, where we've just asked a bunch of New Zealanders, including um, some here today, to say, what would you imagine? What would be, you know, a future New Zealand relationship with the world. And we have a range of different views from people, all Kiwis, but some based here, including some based overseas like myself. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I mean, as a, as a little pitch, cause I know we're rounding up to the end of the conversation, encourage people if you're listening to get in touch with us. And if there are themes you wanna talk about either myself or Thomas or Evelyn, um, cause I think these are really, really important conversations and I've been so thrilled to be part of it today and I have a lot more to say on other other topics but I don't want to hog the hog the mic cool now you're all good thank you for adding that on and I'm hoping that you guys could plug any upcoming projects or whatever um towards the end so people can read or watch or whatever consume um the good stuff that you guys are tuning out um so thank you for that Nina um I'm gonna go back to you Guled uh, for your question um and well, we've had a bit more cordial since you last spoke, but um, something that you were saying um, really resonated with me because, I, you know, like what I think is so powerful about your cordial and who you are is that I think you really resist this um, grateful brown person trope that gets put on us that we should be thankful um, for what we have. And um, I've been thinking a lot about that in the last week or so with the COVID health response bill because. Um, you know, like a lot of us, Marty was saying, you know, we, you, you know, talking about the, uh, you know, unwarranted entry of police onto Marae and also the tangihanga restrictions and, you know, so much of the backlash towards us was, well, you should just be grateful that the government acted quickly because it would have been your people that died from um, a COVID outbreak. And, you know, I've heard you talk um, quite a lot about about that kind of grateful, you know, people put that box on us as if we can't um, be, you know, simultaneously thank you, but also uh, grateful, but also um, pushing for better solutions simultaneously. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but I just wanted yeah. to ask, um, you know, you were talking about um, the the largest COVID breakout in refugee detention camps um, in Africa. And I was thinking a little bit about what role we've played as part of this like colonial body um, in, in making those conditions a thing and in making those refugee detention centres a thing in the first place. And I wanted to know what role do you see um, for Aotearoa to, you know, we're getting a lot of praise at the moment, but how can we actually make that 
you know, a realistic thing and how can we actually genuinely play a positive role in the world as opposed to um, just saying, you know, thank you and moving on without any kind of um, feedback, constructive feedback. Yeah, yeah it's a multi-million dollar question there. Lots to unpack, um, Tam. But um, uh, yeah, the ungrateful thing is just so unoriginal, to be honest. I'm quite over it. Um, it's just so exhausting and tiring. Um, and, you know, just in my own advocacy work, um, that's probably the thing that trolls always come at me at. It's like, oh, you ungrateful refugee, blah, blah, blah. Go back to where you came from if you don't like it. Um, and it's, it's, it's this idea that we somehow there's this unspoken, you know, rule or requirement that resettlement or being resettled in New Zealand as a result of forced migration, which is different from voluntary migration, clearly. Um, comes with this, you know, unspoken condition that we must constantly showcase our gratitude and be thankful. Um, I just, yeah, I really refuse to buy into it. I mean, it just unfolded last night. I saw a tweet um, on who seemed to be quite a senior journalist who, you know, um, said to uh, Gorez Garahman, who's, the, you know, the MP with the Green Party, um, Oh, by the way, I just want to, you know, your backstory is that you come essentially, you know, I'm lo it's a loose paraphrase, but she was essentially saying you come from a refugee background, so um, you shouldn't be in a position to be talking about things like this, you know, and it's absolute ridiculous. Um, I think, you know, um, people, especially people who come from refugee backgrounds, um, they are essentially New Zealanders, um, and, and, and that's what we've signed up to do. And um, I guess a humanitarian policy shouldn't come with conditions anyways. Um, it defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do in that area. And I just think it's, 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 it's frustrating. It's, it's tiring. Again, it's meant to make sure that we don't have a voice and we don't participate in these sorts of um, conversations. Uh, so that is a challenge that we tend to face. And I'm sure it's nothing new to indigenous people. And I'm sure they've probably experienced it and still experiencing it in a much more um, probably, you know, systematic manner and uh, worst fashion, I believe so. So, so that's, that's one thing. Um, you know, I, I feel like we've made a lot of gains in the refugee space, uh, particularly for those of us who have been working in the community on advocacy, um, fighting to ensure that our policies are fair you know, I can't believe we got to fight for that, you know, just so that we don't have a racist, you know, just setting. Uh, it's ridiculous that that's an obligation that's already placed on us as resettled communities. Um, you know, integration is a two-way process. That is, I believe, the responsibility of the whole society as well, just as much, you know, and, and I believe that's where uh, people can pick up the slack uh, a bit in terms of in that sense. But look, we, the numbers in terms of forced migrations are still increasing. Um, and like I said, we have a role and a responsibility to play in that place. Um, I am personally, I'm concerned about what that means in terms of people that are for, displaced right now with COVID, with everything that's happening. Are their lives stuck in a limbo? You know, um, only 1% of the world's refugees are ever resettled into third country like New Zealand. So we're tremendously lucky to be in this position that we were in. And I guess, you know, I'm committed to using the platform and the privileges that I have to ensure that those conversations are maintained. Um, and to be honest, um, there's so much uncertainty and what all of that means. I spoke about how COVID is now just broken out in the largest refugee camp in the world. Um, and just, you know, how numbers are still rising quite dramatically in that space. It's really scary to think what's unfolding in that area. And to be honest, I don't think as a nation, we've started thinking about our role and what we could be doing now that, you know, we are in a place where I guess, you know, we, we're, we're lucky and we're fortunate in terms of the steps and the decisions that we have taken, but that doesn't necessarily mean we don't necessarily have an obligation uh, globally as well. And and every, I invite, you know, every people, people that are tuned in into this discussion, you know, you can all be part of the solution. Write to your minister, write to your local MP, ask them what is happening about this. Can we ensure that those people are kept top of mind? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the fashion of resettlement. What are we doing from an international aid perspective? Um, you know, and I just, 
think those are conversations that needs to be at the forefront. It can't be just on us because it's tiring. We can't be doing it all the time. And I invite everyone that's on this conversation after you're out tonight, you know, finish this, drop a simple email to your minister, your local MP, whatnot, and ask them, what are they doing about this? And how can they ensure that they lobby for good, you know, just humane policy and international um, affairs settings, I suppose. Yeah. Kia ora, Tamisa. Kia I'm going to bring you in on this, Tina. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to, you know, again, coming back off what our brother Guled was just saying about the idea of being a grateful brown person. So much of these kinds of ideas stem from where we think the story starts, right? So they think that the story of somebody who has a refugee background begins when they arrive here in Aotearoa. Well, their story started well before that, but also our wish to that story started well before that. Our relationship to their arrival here began with the way in which we have engaged in foreign policy that has continually that has continued the story of the of the movement of peoples around the globe centered upon imperialism and that's a story that goes that continues to go back through time as well so this just you know i think what Guled was touching on there really highlights the importance of understanding the history of imperialism and how it has continued to form the movement of peoples around the globe and also global injustice, the way in which it has become the underpinnings for trade organization, National Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and how those are now you know, the, the people have the greatest voting power, people of the deepest, the countries of the deepest pockets. Those are the ones who are able to influence movement within those international organizations that regulate world trade, that regulate global poverty. And all of those countries, well, of course, they've got deep pockets. They've got deep pockets from extraction out of indigenous territories. And that's a story that goes back 500 years or more. And so, you know, it's just, it's so important for us to be able to understand where the story starts and how far reaching it is for us to be able to recognize imperialism when it's happening in a neo-colonial sense for us to understand the imperialism that's happening within corporations as well, corporate imperialism and how that's being, you know, uh, meted out across the world as well, but also how that winds up contributing to both the the disparities that exist for indigenous peoples between indigenous peoples and colonial populations but also the situations that wind up bringing people with refugee backgrounds and displacing them and bringing them to our shores as well and then that will completely redefine our responsibilities in terms of what we of how we respond to these situations that are happening around the world and it certainly will take away from this idea of you should just be thankful for what got because nine times out of ten the reason that we're in that place is because of colonialism and imperialism in the first place. It's not only our due, there's much more to come yet. <laughs> Hold on, Tina. So I'm going to um, come to, to you, Nina, because Tina, I think you've, you've raised a really important point, which is about the extent to which colonialism and imperialism are embedded within the very international structures that in a way we rely on or we have tended to rely on for our kind of place in the world as a trading economy and 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 so on and i think that's really it's really it's really problematic and I, so i want to ask you nina what do you think our you know what do you think is the future of these international organizations like the international monetary fund the world bank or you know dare i say it, the world health organization which has kind of been a bit of a political football for you know the us and and china and, and others uh, in this whole pandemic i mean where 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 do those institutions stand and what do you think the role of aotearoa new zealand in those institutions you know should be Thanks, Thomas. And um, yeah, I'll answer that question, but I want to make one small comment to build on what Tina and Gulad said, if that's all right, because one thing that struck me uh, being here in Germany is exactly the debates about migration and refugees. And just to give you a bit of a sense of how these conversations are happening elsewhere, in the neighborhood that I live in, people have put up banners all over, like almost every household saying, leave no one behind. And this is part of a recognition, and I wouldn't say this is widespread in all of Germany, it's partly the neighborhood I live in in inner city Berlin, that's very concerned about refugees, particularly in um, Greece, who've come across from Syria or other places in, in, in the Middle East and Northern Africa, 
and have have been left in in camps um, at the at the borders of of Europe. Um, and there are starting to be, as, as you mentioned, cases in many refugee camps. And of course, as Gulia said, this is a massive problem in terms of um, social distancing, in terms of how do you get proper assistance to people within, within refugee camps. Um, and so in Germany, there has been a big push by some um, in, in, the, in, the, in the refugee community um, and aid organizations to try and get the government to bring in more people in a safe way. Um, however, I wouldn't say that Germany has been super successful either. Um, and here that debate has happened where they've brought in guest workers to pick asparagus because it's the asparagus season. And that's been the priority over bringing in refugees. So I think the point I raised raise this question is to say other countries are having some of these debates and, and this is happening in the public sphere. And there are strong groups of people who are pushing hard for for refugee rights and we we need to think within New Zealand as well what you know all the listeners and everyone on this call and others can do in in this space because I think it is really really important to think about those who are who are most in need who you know don't have access to to the same kind of hospitals and healthcare that um most in New Zealand do um picking up on the question thanks Thomas on international institutions this is a big hot potato and I I could speak for for quite some time on it so I will limit myself to say uh, a couple of things. First of all, international institutions were already um, hot potatoes, if you like, uh, before COVID. So like Tina said, the rise of the right has meant that many people have questioned the role of global cooperation, of global international institutions. And, you know, there are some fair criticisms of some of the work that they do, like Tina has pointed out. Um, but we've seen particularly far right politicians like Trump, um, pulling out, say, of Paris and the climate agreement, um, also in European leaders. Um, also Australia, you know, has been skeptical of things like the global compact on migration. And I think what COVID has done is kind of inflame those tensions even more. We've seen, you know, fights over PPE, medical equipment, and the WHO being a hot potato, particularly, and we haven't talked about this much here, between China and the US. And this has probably been one of the really key interesting things to watch as an international observer, how Taiwan has tried to get observer status because it is not currently a member of the WHO, WHO because it is blocked by China. China doesn't want to see Taiwan being recognized even as an observer because that would, in their view, violate the, the one China principle. Um, and the US, of course, has been extremely also critical of the WHO for being, in Trump's words, too China friendly, um, and has called for reviews and has actually supported Taiwan's bid. And New Zealand, as many of you will be aware, also supported Taiwan's bid. So this, in a way, has put New Zealand in quite an interesting, quite a difficult situation in some ways, because as we've talked about, maybe we don't want to be so friendly with the US. Yet we also, I think many would want to see Taiwan sitting as an observer in the World Health Assembly precisely because they've done so well. They're a country that have dealt extremely well. I think they've got, to my knowledge, fewer deaths than New Zealand, even though they're so much closer than to China. So the point is we would want to see Taiwan there, but ultimately um, it's, been a, it's been a really difficult political situation where New Zealand did support Taiwan's observer status. And as I understand um, at the WHO assembly last week, Taiwan withdrew its um, desire to, to, to be an observer. And I think that hot potato between the US and China, not just over Taiwan, but over the role of international institutions, who should control them is, is, is gonna continue. And I think what New Zealand needs to do, like we've been hearing today, is to continue to think about how do we make uh, institutions which are really important for things like global health, for climate change, do the role that they should to help people in need, whether it be people in refugee camps or whether it be um, providing vaccines. One of the big roles of the WHO, of course, is to try and make sure that any vaccine would be universal, that it wouldn't just be for the rich countries or the rich people. Um, it is to spread the best practices and best guidelines. And so New Zealand should be in that space, standing up and making sure that the WHO can be effective, that it isn't being heavily politicized. And there's one very technical thing that people don't know much about is that most of the WHO's funding is earmarked. What that means is countries say, I want this money to go for this pet project. And that's true in many international institutions. So more than three quarters of WHO's funding is actually earmarked and, and a solid proportion of New Zealand's money that they give to the WHO also is. 
So there's some really important things that, that governments can do is to try and give these international organizations where appropriate more autonomy to use the funding in line with their mandate when it is to, to protect you know, people in need or to deal with global public um, goods or to deliver global public goods like climate change. Um, and I think that that's a really important role that, that New Zealand and New Zealanders should, should be thinking about. So it's such a tricky topic, this, the because I, I feel this massive tension in, in me because I want to support the idea of international architecture being being a kind of positive thing for us to to kind of govern the way we relate to each other. But at the same time, I, you know, I do see all these these massive structural problems in the way that the international architecture was was set up. I don't know. We could, we're not going to resolve it tonight. We've got we've got one um, one final kind of uh, prepared question, and then and then we'll give people a chance if they if they want to kind of jump in and and say anything uh, to to wrap up. And then we will then we will wrap up and we'll talk about um, the the session for next week, which is very exciting as well. Uh, and uh, Tam will close us off with her new karakia that she's just been prepping um okay so last last prepared question is for you sean and i just want to say sean i love sean and sean is one of the guys who helped us right at the beginning of new zealand alternative when we were we were taking nikki's advice uh, of trying to build up the capacity the the institutional scaffolding for change making in aotearoa new zealand and, and sean helped us when when we were thinking through the framing of the organization and and uh and even the name of the organization uh sean so so thanks for that now i want to ask you sean just a question about our role uh in the science community internationally and we've talked about the amazing science communication that you and susie and susie, dr susie wiles and others have been doing dr ashley bloomfield of course uh now I, does, do you feel like there's an opportunity here for the the science communication world to to be looking at us in Aotearoa New Zealand and thinking well they've done a great job uh, does that does that boost our capacity to have an influence internationally in the in the science communication uh, community but maybe in the science community more broadly at a time when you know listening to scientists uh, might not be top of the agenda for for some of the international leaders that that grace our tv screens yeah, I mean, no, no, there's definitely an opportunity. I mean, I, you know, we do have to do have to be honest with ourselves. I take Evelyn's point that we need to look back at what worked and what didn't. And it, you know, there's times when it was held together by sticky tape and wax paper, right? And, and so those those are things we'll have to we'll have to look at. You know, it wasn't wasn't always a smoothly orchestrated, um, uh, you know, rollout of science policy. But but definitely there's international interest. Um, you know, we we. We're all of us that have been involved in the um, in the science response here are getting peppered by international media. I had an invite to go on the Tucker Carlson show on Fox News, um, <laughs> which which I didn't take. <laughs> but uh, but you know it does it does show that the world is is, is actually looking, um, albeit some of it probably quite sceptical at what we did um, and and. So, so yeah, you know, we do need to talk about that and uh, and showcase that internationally. Um, but we, you know, we need to. Um, I think we need to be clear. It was, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a, it was a small group of of values driven people that sort of came together at the right time, um, and 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 you know, and built a, a trusted network um, that that could that that could speak with a, with with a common purpose. Um, and I think that has to be part of the story. You know, we have to be honest about um, the fact we weren't that well prepared, but that it was a shared set of values that drew a group of people together and, um, you know, and let us lead that um, and But that's a, that, that's a message for the rest of the world. I mean, I, 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 I think, you know, we have seen, we have seen the, the rise of right-wing populism and, and, and as in order to, um, to, to ascend, you know, they have to dismantle um, scientific institutions or, or, or at least um, disable them, right? So that they're, they're, they're um, you know, they're ineffective or, or they've effectively been bought off. And, and you know, I think one of the interesting things I'm, I'm going to try and think about more deeply is we, we have a very similar science system to that in the UK, right? In fact, on paper, 
um, they look almost identical, right? The mechanisms that, that are supposed to operate in the UK are the same things that, that we're supposed to do here. We've always, we, you know, our scientists do look towards the, um, the United Kingdom for, for, for our ways of advising government. And so, you know, a big part of the story we have to tell is why we didn't, why did, why did our system work and theirs so spectacularly fail? And, and I think it has, we have to point out it's, it's, it's about the politics of division. Um, and, and, so uh, um, you know, that's to, to successfully, um, use science to, to use knowledge. Um, you know, you, you, you can't have a divided country. You can't have a divided world. And, and that's got to be part of our messaging. Oh, kia ora, Sean. So got a, got a couple of, uh, I would just, just big ups to, to you and everyone who was involved in that. It's, uh, it was so cool and um, well done saying no to Tucker Carlson. Uh, it must have been tempting. So I'm going to go to Tina next and then Evelyn and then basically anybody who wants to just have any kind of final uh, final whakaaro, this is your chance. And then I'll, I'll talk about who we got on the show next week and then Tam will close us off. So um, Tina, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And I just, you know, I, I agree with you, Sean, and, and, and around this, you know, the idea of this, the use of science and the, the um, you know, I, I'm really interested at the moment in our mass psyche and our communal psyche and how we've been able to move as a population and and the rise of the right, as we've said earlier tonight already, it's not just about those people. For me, it's, I'm always fascinated. And who are these people that, that provide the massive support and how has it come to be that groups like Bolsonaro can have such huge support that he does with such abhorrent policies that ultimately spell out the doom for the planet and the same for Trump. How does Trump, how does Trump, how is it that somebody like Bernanders doesn't wind up getting a nation and instead you have Joe Biden and, and so how is it that, you know, um, that Trump winds up with this huge groundswell of support of, of communities of colour, no less as well. And so, you know, I think there's some, um, and and also that this antithesis, this antipathy towards science. How is it that this antipathy towards science is also so widespread? And we saw that we've seen that not just in relation to COVID, but we've seen it in relation to 1080. We've seen it in relation to a wide range of issues um, of great public significance. There's this general distrust of science, and so I think again we need to look back at the story of how science has been used internationally for the option of people around the world, the way in which access to science is also uh, has a level of injustice to it as well. Our access to knowledge systems, our access to, to qualifications, our ability to be able to speak with authority in spaces and spaces and what kind of knowledge is validated and what kind of knowledge hasn't been validated and how that has played into power systems around the world as well. Science has been used as one as a weapon against indigenous peoples throughout our whole story of, of, of um, imperialism and colonization as well. It's been used to justify acts of warfare upon people as well and so science in and of itself is not there's this idea that science is just you know neutral and that it doesn't take a role but science has been anything but neutral throughout history and the oppression of peoples of color and indigenous peoples and and class struggles and economic struggles as well it's been weaponized repeatedly and so you know as a part of these conversations we need to have a look at the way in which class and race has been oppressed through science and has created this space now where there are a lot of people who are distrusting rightfully so distrusting of science but it's also biting us the fact that you know the, the way in which we're not enabling science to be able to well the way in which we're not enabling good science which is inclusive of multiple forms of access uh, inclusive of ideas of justice, inclusive of different knowledge forms and systems, and that that is not the science that we're enabling to, that we're using to enable good decision making as well. Uh, it's again a, a big part of this larger story of the, the rise of the right and how they have also been able to capitalize upon that injustice um, to the detriment of, of the planet and, and many communities of color. 
Kia ora Tina. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the voice of Jess Berenson Shaw, which I often do when we talk about these things. And she's saying the values, it's the values, it's the, it's the values, which obviously you, you mentioned as well, Sean. So we're going to go to Evelyn and then anyone else. Yeah, it's just it's a really quick comment building on what Tina said and in response to Sean's amazing work with sort of science and communication. But it's sort of linking back to this idea of a of a moment of review. It, that is that science, the science communication might not have been the only reason why it was successful. And that there are different forms of communication and lots of different types of languages that actually made what we did achievable. And so, I mean, a basic example is there wasn't a, a five-year-old didn't wash their hands because of science really they did it because they were told to and they saw their friends doing it and that was what they did at school you know it's like um my Samoan neighbor didn't stop going to the supermarket because of science she went because she stopped going because she listened to the radio in Samoan and, and understood the threat that it was to her and her people and that you know why she couldn't go to church and so there's actually I mean, I, I did a PhD in infectious diseases. I love science. I love evidence. I live in the world of evidence, but I'm also really cognizant of how not everybody uses evidence and science to make decisions. And um, so when we think about the effect of communication that happened, we have to do it in this really diverse and inclusive way and make sure that all of the communicators that were important during this time are part of that discussion. Kia ora, Ev. Um, does anyone else want to chip in with any final remarks? Nikki, Guled, Nina, don't feel you you have to, but if there's uh, if there's anything that wants to come out, now's the time. Look, I just want to say I'm I'm you look I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. That is one thing I'm grateful for. Um, but I also just want to say you know look, it's upon us to continue these discussions and these conversations um, and ensure that we take I guess the beautiful stuff that has been said tonight um, by everybody that's pushed in. Um, and like I said, to keep that momentum and that energy going um, and that there's a role for every single one of us to play. So um, yeah, let's just harness that. Kia ora, go there. Nikki? I just echo that. It's been a real pleasure. Um, also, particularly for me, beaming in from, from Europe and hearing what's all on your minds and what you're um, fired up about and where there's space for reflection and just hold on to that energy. And I'd love to love to keep the conversation going with you and the listeners. So thanks to, to Tamitha and Thomas for, for hosting this conversation. Kia ora, Nina. And we're looking forward to the book coming out uh, in a few months. Um, Nikki. Well, I'm going I'm to say more or less the same thing as the others, which is um, I'm going to resist the urge to um, talk more about this, a subject and say thank you, Tam. Thank you, Thomas. I think that it's silence which lets minorities like the um, foreign policy establishment get away with things. And when people start to talk about things, things change. Thank you. Pithy and wise as ever. Nikki, thank you so much. Hey, thanks everyone. Uh, it's been such a good discussion. We we always find that basically the two hours just kind of whooshes by and and we can't even really believe it um but it's been so yeah so rich and and so thoughtful so thank you very much i'm i'm going to hand it over to tam to uh, talk about what's happening next week which is very exciting as well uh and then and then just to close us out uh as uh as only you can so over to you tam and thanks everybody yeah, hey, massive uh, ngā mihi nui kia koutou uh, ngā kaikōrero te pō. Um, thank you all for giving us a bit of your time, whether you're calling in from Aotearoa, where it's very cold, or whether you're calling in from Berlin, where I imagine it could be a little bit warm at the moment. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I just want to thank you for your time and your wisdom and um, just really enjoyed it, actually. Um, so... Yeah, um, so I'm going to announce who we have um, on the town hall next week. So next week is a, it's a massive topic. Um, the topic is whenua house, uh, ownership and housing. Um, so it's a big, it's quite a big subject as, as was this one. Um, and so we've got another awesome lineup for everybody. Uh, we have Pania Newton, who is obviously just an absolute gangster and she 
is such an she's just such an inspirational uh, wahine, and she's obviously been at the forefront of a lot of the ihu mato, um I guess struggle uh, up in um, Tamaki Makoto, and we're really interested to have her on the show to share her experience as someone who I guess dabbles in well not dabbles in both worlds, but has an understanding of both worlds, both Te Ao Māori and Te Ao Pākehā. Um, so really stoked to have her. We have Jade Kake. Um, Jade is an architectural designer from Te Tai Tokiro. Um, she she specialises in papakainga housing and marae development, um, and she helps mana whenua find um, I guess or express their their own values values and narratives through um, the design of the physical environment and, and has been awesome and, um, and, and, and a bit of a watcher of the town hall. Uh, we have Robbie Nickel who has um, just released his and his um, colleagues podcast slash video web series, um, The Citizen's Handbook, which is really, really awesome. And I believe they have an episode specifically on um, whenua ownership and housing. So that's worth checking out as well. Uh, and we also have Jackie Paul. Uh, Jackie is from Tamaki as well. She is a Māori landscape architect and lecturer in landscape architecture and She's also a housing and urban development researcher, so it'd be awesome to have her on. And finally, we have Monique Van Alphen Fife, who is um, is a new property lecturer actually down here at Vic. But um, we actually got her on the show because of a few of my mates that do law. Um, have just been really inspired by the way that she teaches property you know she starts with the fundament you know the shows the fundamental differences and understanding of ownership um between te ao Pākehā and te ao um, maori and um oh she's just awesome and i and i really wanted her to come in and share her insights because she's had such an impact on her students already so um so that's what we're talking about next week and then the week after that it is transport and urban design which is another awesome one which we have some other awesome people lined up so yeah more corridor going although we all start to go back into the physical world um we'll keep these corridor going because we know that a lot of people um enjoy these and have made it a bit of their regular routine on their monday evenings so we're always happy to do this notice there were a few agitated people in the comments who really just want to get on with the actions and they get a bit frustrated with the talking um but you know like we always say i think um it's always important to have wānanga like this and to deconstruct and and figure out what these topics or these kaupapa mean to each of us in our individual capacities and then in our capacities as part of a collective um so so, yeah, it might just be because people were shaken awake maybe earlier this morning, so I don't know. Um, but anyway, I'm going to close off with a karakia um, that my good friend and Wapu shared with me over the weekend. Um, it talks about, it, I think it's a combination of two well-known karakia actually, but it talks about being a released or untied from the restrictions or difficulties or obligations of the day or that the day is brought to us. And it talks about um, your body, spirit, um, wairua being released from any burdens um, and just asking that tāne or um is, you know, imbues us with the vitality to keep going, um, to emerge illuminated and understanding and um, ready for ready for the world, I suppose. So, I am um, Ngamahi Koto and Mia Noi Tato. <clears throat> Unuhia wete wetea, ngā tāmitanga o te wā, ngā kaupehitanga o te wā, ngā heringa o te wā. Kia wātia te ngākau, kia wātia te tinana, kia wātia te wairua. Tomoki a e tāne, tāne te waiora, tāne te whakaputa nei. Ki te whai ao, ki te ao marama. E rongo whakairia, tūturu whakamaua kia tīna. Tīna. Hau mie, hui e, pai ki e. Pai ki e.